Thank you, Carol. Thanks for having me, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, I put together this presentation, and it's focused on scheduling. And I think uh, we talked at lunch, and everybody has an understanding of scheduling, so I'm not going to teach anything about scheduling. It's sort of the process of scheduling and how important it is um, in terms of the success of a project. It's one of the key aspects, and I think you all know that, but somehow, uh, based on what happens in projects, it doesn't always go that well. And so one of the things I want to point out is some of my experiences. And as I was putting this together, every slide I had, I can almost point to an example of why it's there and what happened. I'm not going to go into a bunch of war stories, but it was sort of interesting how it all came together. Um, I'm just going to uh, give you a little introduction about my background. Carol gave it to you. And, um, I'm an engineer by background, and I got an MBA um, in finance, and um, that's sort of my experience. I grew up in an architectural family, so I have architectural blood, but I went to become an engineer. Um, just a little shift in the way my career path, instead of going from the beginning to the end, I think I'll just tell you a little about where I am now and drift back to how the hell I ever got there, which sometimes when I start out, I'm not sure I would ever plot this is where I would end up. So you never really know. Um, right now, I do a lot of work as an advisor. Uh, a lot of the practice has been dispute resolution worldwide, uh, nationwide. All projects, heavy civil to high-rise condominiums to all sorts of technical elements. Um, I also have worked limited roles, but um, as an advisor on large projects overseas. One was a railroad. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, another was a big city in Saudi Arabia, and an Egyptian power plant. So there's some of those projects, and I can explain a little about that. So my background for the probably the last 15 years has been dispute resolution, project advisory, structuring projects, interfacing the engineering, the design, the construction arms together to kind of move forward on a project. And a lot of these projects were requests for proposals. So many of them didn't happen. Uh, some happened in a different way, but it was a great experience and really made a good network of people and contacts. Kind of how I got there was through engineering as an undergraduate, but basically spending time as a developer. I left in 85 to start my own business and uh, just did everything I could to earn a living. I was a structural engineer, so I did consulting, foundations, structural rehab work building designs, all small stuff, but you know, all hands-on, usually with some form of a problem around it. Something wasn't working right. Then I led into development management, where I started participating as a developer, young developer with some seasoned people, went through all those trials and tribulations, and then worked in, um, sort of sold those services to other people who were developing land and projects, predominantly large residential projects. So that's kind of what happened from that point of view. And then prior to that, I was really pretty lucky when I got out of school. I got some heavy engineering right away, covered a lot of ground, um, left and got into a large construction company as an estimator. And we did two or three big, big projects, landed one in Mississippi, it was a big heavy dirt job, the biggest one outside the Panama Canal. And it was sort of amazing to do it. We had absolutely no computers. So we did the entire control estimate down to the penny with spreadsheets, calculators, and pencils, and laid it all out because if we made a mistake on 100 million cubic yards of earth by a penny, it was a million dollars of profit. So we had to set this whole control up on an 11-mile canal and monitor it. So that was a really great project. Got involved estimating, we won it, ended up spending some time there, and then came back and did another building job, so did some vertical jobs, and then eventually started my own business. Um, so it was, you know, a little bit's luck, just being in the right spot at the right time. Um, I guess the message I take away is sort of, you know, trying to keep educating yourself, trying to keep pushing yourself to learn a new experience. You know, I kind of was in the design shop. I didn't really have a passion for one particular element of the design. I liked it, but it really wasn't my passion, so I kind of drifted to construction. And I like working with people. That's just the way I happen to enjoy it. So I got a lot of enjoyment out of getting a group of knuckleheads together on a project and making them all sing to the same song. And that kind of leads into scheduling. At the end of the day, you got a whole different group of people. The projects are a little different, but it's really the people that makes it really different and challenging. 
So some people like it, some people don't like it. And sometimes it's confrontational, sometimes it's sort of strategy and negotiation. So it really just fits your own you know, perspective on what you like to do. Um, so what I want to talk about today is scheduling and why it's important. And when I look back on all those elements and what really makes successful projects outside of getting a reasonably good budget and staying within some cost controls is how do you choreograph everybody on the project? And how do you as a participant in the project kind of appreciate that choreographing? Um, I'm going to kind of put some fundamental points out. I don't think any of these are overly novel. Um, they're pretty basic concepts. Um, we, but what, what I look at now after looking at, Carol said, like over 170 disputes, so projects that have gone bad, and I added those up, and that's a lot of projects. These are sort of the themes that I've come out of those projects when they relate to delay analysis, productivity, cost overruns. And when I go back at them, I can kind of tell you a war story about every bullet on the slide, but they seem to be the types of things that generated the most uh, problem with the project and things that could have been fixed. And so I want to highlight those. And as you guys kind of go forward and utilize scheduling as part of your tool set, um, maybe these things will stick in your mind. Um, one thing people like to say is a schedule, you know, we have a schedule, we can't change it. That's fundamentally the schedule's dynamic. It changes. It changes the next day after you've put it together. So you really have to accept the fact that the schedule is dynamic and it will always change, which means you have to change with it, you have to be creative, and you've got to kind of deal with what's thrown at you. Um, it is a critical management tool, um, and it needs to be well managed. I think we all understand having a good plan, working the plan, and then working the schedule again. It's constant. It's constant thinking, and nothing really should be static on it. And it also must reflect the current and reflect really material changes. So all these things are pretty basic, but you'd be surprised out on a site. And some companies do it well. Some companies don't do it so well. But it also involves a lot of different people. So the contractor may have a plan, but he's got to interface with the architects, the designers, and the owners. Do they have the same plan? Um, a current accurate schedule facilitates a successful project. Responsibly managing changing condition greatly improves the probability and the performance ob objectives. And one of the things we've coined Oh, a number of years ago was this rules of engagement. I was involved in the big dig in Boston for about 10 years in a whole series of really great consulting assignments. I got in there as a management review and I stayed for 10 years doing all sorts of troubleshooting and a lot of different elements of it. This is where this came out in terms of rules of engagement. How are the parties going to play together? How are they going to interpret the schedule? How are they going to deal with it? And how are they going to make ultimately decisions? And um, Having a successful schedule, having it you know, accurate, really helps give you a basis for making good decisions at the time you have to make the decision. So some fundamentals. Okay, what, what do we need to do a good schedule? Okay, we need to create a good baseline. So typically a good baseline, a comprehensive basis, and what are the expectations? You know, so look at your project. You may only know some of the project early on, and you may not know some of the issues that pop up later, so you'll develop that a little later. But as you move forward, you really got to understand the project and how it's going to come together and what are the performance expectations. And are they reasonable? Somewhat reasonable. They may be aggressive, and you can kind of play with that a little bit, but they got to be reasonable and achievable. Um, one of the other elements in terms of the fundamentals is keeping the schedule updated, and typically monthly. That's logical but I can show you half the projects that don't do it. They don't update it, because somebody's got to rework the schedule. Oh, we got to update it. Well, it takes them four months to update it. That's terrible. You, you're working now, so keep a schedule active, and then do an update or a logic change or something like that. So it's really important to keep the schedule updated. And I think you know accuracy to the best one knows it, transparency, Everybody needs to work from it. Like I said, it's a combination of a lot of people working, so you really need to be transparent to try to optimize their performance. And then the other aspect is giving prompt and informative notice. This really applies to contractors more so. Contractors are typically the owners of the schedule. They'll produce the schedule. They're the means and methods. 
they really should engage the architects and the owner. And a lot of contractors and most contracts, almost all contracts have a notice provision. When something doesn't go according to schedule, notify the owner. And a lot of them won't do it. They don't want to annoy the owner. Or they don't want to bring it up or they, they think it'll go away. It's really essential to provide notice to the owner of a change or a potential impact. You don't have to be obnoxious about it. You just kind of give them the information. This happened. This is what we're going to try to do. You're not placing blame, but you're telling the owner what's going on. I can't tell you how many projects where the owner has gone through, gotten the schedules, and never was noticed. And you hear later, well, we didn't want to upset them, you know, particularly in a private kind of a relationship. They think it's going to upset the owner. It's one of the fundamental flaws. Let them know, let them know nicely, explain it to them, have time to explain it to them. Um, time impact analysis. Utilize time impact analysis. And really, probably you all know what that is, but to develop a logical relationship of a potential impact or event in the currently planned activities. And these relationships, we call them fragnets. It's really important to, in the updating process, as change occurs, relatively material change, to kind of get that into the schedule. What does it do to my logic? How do I put it into the schedule and then rerun the schedule? We also, I'll go into a little of that later in terms of how to do a fragment. I have an example of a project, just a real project with P6. Um, use discipline and be committed. Um, really maintaining it despite the pressures of the project. When you're running a job, everything changes every single day. There's a lot of pressure. It's somewhat like a fire drill but you really got to try to set back and put some discipline into the process. And many times I've had to do that on projects I've run, weekends, nights, when the project dynamic is going, people are off the site, kind of set back, okay, where are we? How did we get there? What are our changes? And that's also the creative part. That's really where I think the fun is. You deal with a bunch of situations on a project, you didn't plan for them, they've caused you a lot of agita. How do you go back, kind of go back to the paper, figure out a way, see if there's a way to work around it. And it's kind of rewarding when you can kind of launch it and then things work out and you get back on schedule. So the discipline and being committed, and all this kind of boils down to making informed decisions. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing on the project is to make a decision. So if you have a schedule, you look at the situation at the time, you encounter it, you run it through, and you make a decision. It's not gonna get better as time moves on. So those are sort of the key fundamentals. What I've seen from the reality of schedule is really an inadequate vetting of the process. When the baselines are put together but they're not fully explained to the owner and the designer and even the key subcontractors. So a contractor may put one together, this is the schedule, you're going to live by the schedule. Well, that's nice to say but it may be impractical. The sub may not have the resources, the owner may not have the ability to make decisions, the design team may not have enough people to review the shop drawings. So it really needs to be vetted to see if everybody buys into that. Um, it's also important to have clear expectations. You know, the owner and designer requirements should be highlighted by the contractor. So for example, if we're putting up a curtain wall or a granite fascia, sometimes the owners want to have a view of it. They want to see a mock-up. That needs to be allowed for in the schedule. So those are an example of what you need to do in terms of incorporating others part of the process so they don't come and surprise you. You know, if you say five days for a mock-up, that's fine, but does everybody else buy into that? And then the schedules in terms of the updating, they're not accurate. So they, they don't really reflect the activity on the project. So that is one of the big issues we've seen and looking at the to-go schedule at the time you do the update, is this our best expectation on where the project's going to go? Unidentified fragments. So now we have a schedule and we have it moving along. We have issues that occur and these fragments or these impacts, they're not put into the schedule. So if they're not into the schedule, it's really not reflecting the plan and therefore it loses the integrity and the value of the model. So you know, it no longer really becomes a useful management tool. And if it doesn't really become a management tool and people don't believe in it, then people won't follow it and then you have no plan. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've seen is insufficient resources or personnel. Um, projects are everything, everybody has a budget. So there's tight budgets everywhere. Really trying to make sure there's 
adequate attention to the schedule, that there's resources, people who can update it, gather the information, get it into the schedule. And sometimes you'll see somebody saying, I'm the scheduler. And you find out, well, what do you schedule? I get, I schedule it here. Have you been in the field? No, I haven't been in the field. So how are you scheduling anything? You're not talking to the superintendents. The superintendents are doing this. You're over here scheduling an at, and you do that for a few months, and you guys don't know where you are. And um, so it's really, I think schedulers are one of the key pieces, key management structures on the project. It's not working the software. That's just one little part of it. It's really getting out in the field, talking with the people who are driving the work, getting accurate information, and getting it in there. And I can tell you a project in Canada that went disastrous. We had a great scheduler. We had a lot of people in the field. It was a nuclear project. They would update the schedule. Afterwards, we were doing some forensic analysis. Oh, we just told him whatever we wanted to tell him. It didn't really matter. He got him out. Of, he was a pain in the ass. And, you know, get him out of here and give him the information. Well, he did that month after month. The schedule didn't really mean anything. And people were trying to make decisions at upper management with a job schedule that didn't reflect what was going on in the job because they were just trying to get rid of the guy. So I think the other aspect of this is when you're kind of getting out there trying to get information from your field people, it's the interpersonal skills. How do you solicit information? You know, they're busy, they got a job, they're pushing, they're dealing with all the headaches. How do you kind of get the information and get it honestly so you can incorporate it and move it forward? So that's really a key, key point to it. Um, failure to maintain this has huge performance impacts. Costs to all the parties, I think it's obvious. I think one of the bigger costs is when there is a problem or there is a claim or a dispute at the end of the job, it's extremely expensive to go back and reconstruct the schedule in terms of what happened on the job. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars can be spent trying to recreate the job in terms of who did what, when, who's responsible, what's concurrent delay, what's not delay, what's driving. And when you do all this, you, you can't look at it really from hindsight, which forensically you are, but you have to sort of step in the shoes at the time the parties were making these decisions and say, okay, what did they know in October two years ago when they made the, the decision to go there? Was it good information? Was it bad information? Was the decision prudent? If it was, that's what's got to be captured. Not hindsight saying, well, they should have done this, they should have done that, because they, they didn't know that. Um, the other issue is insincere buy-in. This happens a lot with um, sort of the subcontractors many times. The contractor bids the job, they'll put the schedule forward, they'll bring their subcontractors in, and they really don't get that buy-in. They really don't sit down and work through the major subs to really get them to endorse the schedule. Um, the other aspect from the designer's point of view we've seen is that the architects don't really get involved. They somewhat shy away. We're trying to push that forward where the architects get more involved. They should understand the schedule or the engineers, understand the schedule, understand how the contractor's putting it together, and if they see issues, raise it up to the owner. They have an obligation. They may be, there might be a reason for it, but they really need to understand the schedule, see if it's realistic, and see if it meets their expectations for the design. All right, I want to talk a little about rules of engagement. Um, rules of engagement, they must be established. So you sort of see the overview on how to look at the schedule. But when you get into the day-to-day -day aspect of it, trying to elaborate on how do we do these fragments? How do we get this information into the model and move forward so we can make these good decisions? So we try to establish those early. They must be clear, simple, and accepted. This is pretty straightforward, and everything, again, must be vetted during the pre-contract negotiations. So what you want to do is when you put the team together, or as the team comes together, who's going to update it? When's it going to be updated? What do we do with a fragnet? How are we going to get it in? We'll do it. It's going to be in every month. Fine. It's really simple, but you'd be surprised how that doesn't go. So it's just setting up who's going to do what, making sure they understand what they're doing, and then having a model that's accurate. And then vetting that in terms of making sure Everybody on the project understands it, particularly the subcontractors in a job that's heavily subcontract weighted. Um, the rules also must be actionable. What I mean by that, they should be explicit. We will update on every pay rec, or we will put in the updates in the frag nets every month, and we'll look at them. We may not make decisions right away. We may have a meeting, 
every two months or something, depending on the magnitude of that, and who's going to be involved in that process. And what you really want to see is the owner, design team, and contractor primarily, but on large vertical construction, you really want the MEPs there, their driver, and you know, structurals depends on where you are on the project. So you really like to try to get those people in um, and get their feedback. Um, one of the most important aspects is taking these rules and now integrating them to the contracts um, and making it a contract obligation. There are some good specifications out there that we've worked with that are pretty strong and there's a lot that aren't very strong. I think the one biggest issue I have is you know, complying to the schedule, um, making sure people are updating it. The other is notice. It's surprisingly how they don't give notice. And the installation of the fragments is another key component in terms of contract obligations and really trying to make sure those are spelled out in their contracts so everybody understands that they have that obligation. Um, just benefits. It's obvious, but from an owner's point of view, it's not too important how the job gets built, but do they have confidence that the job will be built and meet the milestones or the completion schedule? They're more about confidence. Yes, I can believe in the schedule. It's going to be done by May, and I, can, I, have, a, I have proof. They, they're hitting their milestones. So that's one of the things they're concerned with is accountability and confidence that based on whether it's tenants moving in, they can be assured that that project schedule represents what's going to happen on the job, not that they're going to get surprised one month before and find out we're not going to open for six months. Designer, their point is really to enhance their construction administration side. Once the contractor is sort of moving, how does designer play along? He's got to turn shop drawings around. He's got to answer questions. He's got to look at mock-ups. Does that fit into the schedule? Is there enough time? And again, is there enough people in the architect and the sub-consultant <coughs> staff to accomplish what needs to be done with the schedule? And then the contractors, obviously it improves the management and the performance, and it re really lowers their financial impacts in terms of cost overruns and changes that have to be either vetted out later after the fact. Um, from an issue resolution point of view, things will happen on the project. This really provides contemporaneous information on what's going on on the project. And I think that's the strongest part of the equation in terms of understanding a good schedule is what was happening today, what were the decisions today, and we don't have a crystal ball, so we have to make good decisions. So contemporaneous schedule information is very important. And in a quarter dispute, looking back on it, it's weighed very heavily in terms of what the parties knew at the time in making those decisions. It also provides a sound and appropriate basis for analysis and assessment of responsibility. So you might get into a, a dispute on a time impact. Most times, people will understand the impact occurred. They may not know who's responsible for it, but they certainly can identify this occurred, maybe an example of a differing site condition. We hit it. It took 24 days. We know what happened. You should have had it in your contract. No, you should have had it out. You, you, they argue that all day long. But we can capture the time, and we can get it into the schedule, and we can deal with a workaround on how to accommodate that, and then we'll let the commercial side work itself out, typically through the contract provisions. And it, it's very cost effective. Um, uh, this probably should have gone first, but it's a development of a risk register. Um, this came, one example of this was a large project I had in Saudi Arabia where I put a large team together and was sort of orchestrating everybody. And we built this huge risk register for a $6 billion project. And we were taking it from concept to financing. So everything under the sun in the middle of a foreign country dealing with all the challenges. So we really looked at things, started taking apart the design. For example, design and environment. There's other risks as well, financing risks, things like that. But from a design point of view, you know, looking at long lead items, that's really important. Specialty products, one-of-a-kind components, and also understanding how these things all interface on the project. So early on in developing the schedule, a good way to start out is, okay, what are the risks in this project? Before we even start putting anything together or thinking of the logic, what are unique elements of the design that need to come into play? Um, then you have the environmental issues. Where is it? What are the logistics? 
weather, labor supplies, all that. So kind of setting that up and setting up this register before you even start the schedule is really a good value component to it. And then you add it. It's live, so it doesn't end. It, 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 it gets dealt with as you put the schedule together. You try to consider these elements in building the durations, the relationships, allowing sort of buffering and some float to accommodate some of these potential. Um, you also need to look at stakeholder expectations, productivity, and various elements. One of the big issues that comes into play in all this is uh, egos and personalities. They're major, major influencers in the effectiveness of the schedule. So I said earlier, a team comes together for the first time. You got an owner's group. You got a designer's group. You got a contractor's group. Most likely they haven't worked together. You got a whole mix of how that team is going to work together. That is probably one of the biggest impacts I've seen on scheduling is how to get everybody to work together and flow in the same direction. And you got to deal with those egos. Um, from a scheduler's point of view, who might not be the project manager, it's sort of stepping into those personalities and how do you sort of win their confidence to get good information and kind of deal with their egos. And um, that's what's you know, that's kind of the art side of it. Getting good information out, dealing with the different people, getting it into the schedule where they all have ownership of it, therefore they're all gonna believe in it and kind of work together. And also project leadership. I and mean, you really have to have the leadership behind the schedule. Some jobs I've seen where the construction manager doesn't even have the scheduler on their payroll and they outsource the scheduling and I'm like, what are you really supposed to be doing? Why? It's the most the critical part of the job and you've outsourced the scheduling. They outsource it so somebody can put it in the computer and get something back, but that's what they see as the scheduling. They haven't really embraced the scheduling. That's the last part of it. You know, the major part of it is getting good information in and that's where we see things break down. So really getting project leadership to support it, make sure there's resources available is really critical. Um, also forecasting potential issues early, verifying conditions and, you know, ensure performance. Again, subcontractors, major issue. One of the things about subcontractors on a building job particularly, they all have their own unique requirements. They're there to make money. They're there to put their product up as fast as possible. They'll cooperate as long as it doesn't cost them money. So the art of this is how do you get them all working in harmony so they all can make the money but get the project done on time and that becomes challenging because there's some compromises so you have to help out in one where you help out the other but if you keep in mind they all want to make some money and if you're helping them facilitate it your job will go smoother and they will be less of a problem and they'll support it um, as issue arises you know understanding who's responsible um, easier said than done. Everybody wants to point the finger. I think it's human nature. At some point, you just got to accept responsibility. If you messed up, messed up, get on with it, look at a workaround and move forward. And then also I think the communications, um, again, is important and making difficult decisions. So you're going to have this model. You're planning the to-go schedule. You're dealing with all the issues. Communicate, communicate, let them know what's going on. And don't be afraid to bring the subcontractors in. I've done that on many projects and sat around a table on a Saturday thinking, okay, how are we gonna turn a floor over? And we got like a six day cycle and we all strategized for a few hours and came up with an idea. Some risks were added. We said, okay, we'll take those risks and we worked it and it worked out successfully. So getting their input is helpful and un, uh, you know, unaddressed issues will just get worse. Summary, maintaining commitment to the process is critical. Um, ensuring you got adequate contingencies and risk assessments in terms of understanding your risks, recognize them. You're not sure when they're gonna come. You might know where they're gonna come. Um, we did a project on an LNG facility and we didn't really think about, we knew nickel was a big issue, nickel welding was a big issue, but we never thought, nobody ever thought about the uh, prepping of the cryogenic piping that brought the LNG into it. And so they subcontracted all the piping out to about seven different sub-consultants to prep the pipe and paint it. Kind of makes sense. They, nobody had a big enough shop to do it. Well, we found that one of the subcontractors 
didn't have really the right quality control. So all the pipe got done, it got coated, it put it in, they did the test on it and found one of the pipe coatings was not up to snuff. They ended up having to rip the entire two miles of piping out, pull it back up, redo that pipe. That became a real big issue in terms of a risk register. So if anybody comes into LNG with cryogenic piping, pay attention to pipe prep. It's really, really important. Make sure the QC's there, make sure the shop is there. Um, and that was you know, a risk. Nobody really thought about it on that project. Um, again, transparency. I think I keep repeating this about keeping it healthy, the relationship on the project. It needs to stay healthy. There is lots of pressures putting projects together. Um, how do you keep it flowing? How do you keep it fun? How do you keep a relationship going so you don't get these tensions building up? Tensions build up, people aren't honest, and you're really not in a good position to troubleshoot issues as they occur. Accept the time impact of an event and make a decision. So when you put a fragment in and you see the impact, recognize it, do something about it, make a recommendation to do something about it. At the very least, make a recommendation to do something. You may not be in the power to do it, but you've made the recommendation whether the powers to be decide to take the recommendation, that's theirs. All right, deploying these rules of engagement. Um, this may be a little repetitious, but um, you know, no difference in management of the schedule. We looked at design build, design bid build. There's really no difference, it's the same. Um, I think some of the challenges in design build are greater than in design bid build. Um, we have the designer and the contractor working closer. The design's not done. They secure the project. Preliminary schedules are sent out. Owners buy them. They've committed to a cost. They've committed to a time, yet they haven't really finished the design. Things start to crack at that point. And a lot of times I've seen that the contractor sets the schedule up, but hasn't really engaged its designer subcontract partner in terms of working that schedule. Most of the time I haven't seen it. So really getting the designer and the contractors on design build is really a critical point, point to the overall success of that project. Um, I, I use this word synchronization. Um, you read the specification and you look at shop drawings will come in, we have 30 days to review the shop drawing, we have five days to review FRs, you have all this stuff. If you ever tried to put that into the schedule, the job would be four years beyond itself. So it doesn't really synchronize with the speed of the job. So when you look at the specifications, you kind of have to look at it and say, okay, what are the key elements and reach agreement on key submittals? Yes, there's certainly submittals if they come in early, can come back in 30 days. Painting submittals, fine, nobody's going to do that. So get it in early and you can kind of work it through. But this synchronization in terms of RFIs, I had one case where the structural steel came in just before Christmas, the schedule had it due back on January 15th, and there was something like 250 structural steel shot drawings. You know, the, 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 it was impossible, you know, but nobody looked at the schedule. It was on the schedule, but the structural engineer never saw it, or if he got it, didn't recognize it. It became a real problem, because that's what drove, and it's pretty easy to understand, structural steel is usually on the critical path. Um, so synchronization and working the schedule with the owner's requirements. That's typically the contractor's job. Um, one of the things, this is sort of one of the things we've seen is in many projects you have this big spe scheduling spec, a lot of requirements, and you kind of assume it's all priced in the contract. Technically it is, but it would be interesting if they actually had a line item out of that that we're going to allocate X for the scheduling. So it's going to be follow the spec, I want to see the resources, I want to see the project scheduler, and I want to make sure, if, pick a number, if it's 10,000 a month, it's 10,000 a month and they're getting everything they bargained for. Sometimes it's kind of clouded and you don't really get that performance and it becomes a battle. So that's something I'd like to see. Um, I think owners must also review the reasonableness of the schedule with regard to their obligations and that of the designer. And I think the owner needs to really understand the schedule, understand what it needs to do, when it needs to approve mock-ups, what decisions it needs to do, and really kind of understands it. And maybe they just need to have the contractor come in and instead of just passing the schedule back and forth, really have a discussion. Put it up on the board, come in here, let's walk through the whole thing, 
and make sure everybody understands it. And that should go hand in hand with the designers. They don't typically know what's going on. They sometimes run away and say that's means and methods, but they really should understand it. Not that they have to live and develop it, but they need to know where they fit in. Um, from a designer's point of view, they have two concerns with the schedule. One, they have a lot of technical elements in the design. Is there adequate time? Is it incorporated into the schedule? Do we have enough time to do the mock-ups? Do we have enough time to review the shop drawing with a proper review? Do we have critical tests, things like that? So they're very concerned with how are they going to accomplish the technical side of the project in this schedule. And then the logic and durations, they should look at it. Are they reasonable? And sometimes if they don't really understand, then they should bring some support in or recommend to the owner that they bring support in. Um, when owner participation is involved in making decisions, time must be allocated in the schedule for these decisions. And we, we've already kind of pointed that out with a mock-up. Contractors, from their point of view, in terms of alignment, it should be strongly encouraged, if not mandated, to actually have their subcontractors at the meeting. Um, vertical construction, which I've done a fair amount of, I really like the subcontractors there. I mean, your electrician, your mechanical, your plumbing, they run the job, actually. You know, I mean, if they're not singing the right song, you're not getting that building open. So you better get them at the table, get their important features brought out, their life safety, and make sure they're supporting the schedule and you can really hear it uh, from a contractor's point of view. Other subcontractors you can kind of fit in when, they're, when they need to fit in. And then really, again, promoting teamwork and keeping that relationship healthy. The contract language between the owner and the designer and the subcontractors, as much as you think, it, it should be back to back. So if there's scheduling requirements that an owner may have of a contractor, is that language consistent with the designer's requirement? I've seen two different schedules. We had a contractor have this schedule because one arm of the ownership decided to contract it out. It was a state agency. Another arm of the state agency contracted the designer. They had two different schedules. Well, we didn't know this to here. They didn't know that to there. And God knows what the subcontractors had. So it was really quite a mess. And the contracts were signed. People were moving. And it, it took the, quite a lot to sort out later. Um, how do you deploy these rules? Um, again, it should be outlined during the design stage, so typically it is. Typically there's some milestones. It'd be great to get the scheduling involved early on with the design, start to sketch it out, let the designers know where their owner's mandates are. It can become more robust as the design evolves, as the contractors engage. Um, the means and methods, they need to be consistent with the technical spec. They really need to look at that um, in terms of making sure the right checks and balances are there, making sure the technical specs are complied to fully and um, not after. I have a huge project right now. It was pretty obvious. There was a concrete specification. It was a design build. It was supposed to be for water use, uh, heavy water use. Um, they had the hardest time getting the, comp the, the mix design right. It was in the spec. It was always known. It was design build. Why it took them six extra months to get a mix design to meet the specification really scratches your head. But I think the contractor didn't really contemplate the mix design and probably felt that it was similar to other mix. I'll just send it in. I'll get my mix design. And you know, 30 days, I'm off to go. Not the case. The technical specs were so such that it really needed a lot more finesse on the mix design. And it ended up costing the project six months just on the mix design. <coughs> ended up being a very large component of damages, too. Um, the schedule needs to kind of cover the work, but it shouldn't be a checklist. It shouldn't be everything you got to do. So you got to remember the schedule is a management tool. So you kind of have to manage it to the level you're able to understand the work. So, you know, there's checklists for everything else. You can kind of go down and you can look at the form work and you can kind of checklist everything down to where to put the tie rods, where to set the rebar, how to pull it off. But, you know, on a schedule, you might want to open that up a little bit. You know, you're concerned with form work, you're concerned with the pour, you're concerned with the cure and the strip, you know. So sometimes you don't want to get overly detailed, but there's nothing wrong with having a checklist. 
So when you're out in the field, okay, these are the things that we have to make sure get accomplished to ensure that that activity is performed adequately. And sometimes that ties back to the technical specs. Um, it's pl obviously, it's a planning control tool. It's there for sufficient detail. We sort of talked on that, and I already talked about the checklist. Um, the other aspect of this is the capabilities assessment. This kind of goes back to who, who do we have? Do we have people who have the experience? Don't we have the experience? What are our subcontractors like? Do they work with a schedule? Do they even know what it means? How do they interface? So all that kind of comes up early, and that's a good area in the risk register. If you don't have the risk register and you get the job, try to figure that out early, and you may have to help some of the subs through some of the elements. Um, the designer as a representative should also be very comfortable. I, I, many, many designers don't really get involved with the schedule. They just, that's the contractor's domain. Yet you come back and they have a, a hand in that and they should be comfortable with it. And under certain, under certain situations, you know, if they're not and it's a complicated project, they should have a reasonableness check done. You can get an independent party. You could just get the contractor to come in have them explain it to you in plain English, go through all the elements. We did a job for um, a federal agency, had a big contractor. We were brought in to do a reasonableness check on the contractor, went back and forth, a couple of baselines. We all agreed, um, got the baseline set, and then every month we got the updates. The fragments were installed right. Occasionally there were some issues. Occasionally there were some disputes client would call, can you look at this, give us a recommendation, went pretty smoothly all the way along. And you know, just by having this, the client didn't have the expertise, uh, they didn't need anybody full time on site, they were pretty good about collecting the information, but they didn't really understand how to go through the assessment phase you know, when something did come up. Now deploying those rules, transparency with the owner and the design team. Um, it seems obvious, it doesn't happen. The baseline schedule and all periodic dates should be in PDF and electronic native file. This is sort of a pet peeve I have is, work with a lot of design firms and you'll ask where's the schedule and you'll get a nice PDF of the schedule. It's pretty much useless. Unless I get the electronic data, I need to know if there's a, if the job's running smoothly, that's fine. But if I don't have the electronic file and something doesn't run smoothly, or I may have a design change, or the owner may have a design change, what's that going to do to the schedule? And after the fact, it's really hard to get all this stuff. So it's really important, I believe, to have the designers getting the electronic file. They may not even have to open them. They may not have the software, but they can get them. They're entitled to them. And if something came up, they at least have the current schedule. They can go back and either bring somebody in to look at it or not. We just actually did a monitoring project on a big project, went very smoothly, had a good contractor, they did all the fragments, everything worked well. A year after the fact, a dispute arose, allegations were shared, one of the things was a schedule delay. We got notice last Thursday, we had the schedule analysis done over the weekend, I presented it Tuesday, everything was done just because we had all the data. It would have taken two months just to get the schedules and then just to come up with the answer. So it really does work and it saved a lot of time and it's contemporaneous, so there's no argument. That's what it was. It was all submitted to the owner. So having the electronic file, which the design team did not have, we had it, um, really helped them a lot. Um, native format, we just sort of highlighted all those in the PDF. Um, I'm kind of repeating that. I think down here, internal personnel may not be versed, so you know, use third party or contractor. And um, again, reinforcing the updates as a contemporaneous plan. Um, from a planning and impact assessment perspective, sharing the schedule really ensures that all the parties are informed to make clear decisions and clear understanding of the implications and each entity really needs to take responsibility. And, you know, it's sort of a word I looked at it, respond, but I can, there's so many cases where they don't take, nobody takes responsibility. Yes, we messed up. Yes, this is what happened. Yes, maybe we messed up, 
but how do we resolve it? That's okay too. So we can go on to resolving it. We can deal with who owns the, the problem later, but at least we can get the res resolution done. Um, from a change order claim perspective, it provides what I said, accurate impact situations like the example I just talked about. And um, you know, the claims environment is sort of interesting. Um, if you can, you know, a root cause investigation might be pretty complicated. It could take a year in some cases to figure out what happened. I had a nuclear matter we talked about. It took almost a year just to figure out what the root cause was. But we knew what the implications of the time were. So we could have got that. We knew the time implications. Decisions were made. We had to go back and do a lot of analysis on the root cause, going way back to the preliminary design stage and going through all that investigation to determine what was the cause of the event. So you can kind of get the time figured out and then deal with the cause. If you had to go back and you didn't have a current schedule, it would just be triple the time. Um, a time impact analysis. The baseline schedule is established and periodic, uh, periodic updates are provided to the owner and the design team so the fundamentals are in place to management and to make these decisions. So we go back to notice, we go back to a good model, we got these decisions. Now events will occur, they'll occur frequently or infrequently, um, and you need a timely way to deal with those. I've been on a case, it was in the big dig, um, we would have an event that impact the schedule two or three or four a day. It was a utility thing. So every time somebody moved, we would have an, an event. How do you get it in the schedule? What does the impact occur? So it was occurring every single day. So we would be able to get it in. They got it into the schedule. We'd keep a list of it, and we wouldn't reconcile everything every day because you could work it out. But at the end, the end of the month, sit down, look at the impacts, decide, okay, are we going to need a time extension? Are we going to need to do some acceleration? Is this in the contract? Is it out in the contract? Whose responsibility? But we at least knew when they occurred, what they were, and that the schedule was still accurate. accurate. So the owner could count on the fact, well, okay, we are projecting this to be completed. We have an accurate set schedule. And that was the most important thing from the owner. We could work out the commercial terms, but at least we knew where the job was going to be because we knew what the impacts were. Um, kind of reinforcing that when impact events have a blurred responsibility, they need to move beyond that. So, so many times everybody gets hung up with cost. It's cost, commercial, just put the responsibility away. I used to say, just forget it. Just, we know it happened, right? Everybody knows it happened. Yes, okay, let's figure out when it, what it did to the schedule, what it's gonna do the job, and how we're gonna work around it first. We'll come back and figure out who owns it. And once you kind of just say that, they get it, I might have to say it a little forcefully, but they get it. Um, and the contract language will address that, you know, negotiation, mediation, whatever the case may be. Um, the contractor should develop the fragments showing how the events occur. So typically going through the process, develop the fragments, what happened on the job. Once complete, it's put into the baseline or the current schedule at the time just before the impact. And when the schedule is rerun, the result of the impact with respect to subsequent activities will be identified. And this will provide the basis for whatever recovery you may have to deal with. There's only two things that really happen. Once you run it and it delays the project, you gotta make a decision. There's only two things you can do. You either accept the delay or you recover from the delay. And you might do that right away. You might do that later. What we have seen on that LNG project, they had a really good spec they didn't let the recovery go more than 60 days. So if you had an impact, fine. How are you gonna recover it? And you gotta recover it in 60 days. So typically, that was, that was really good. It forced them to come up. It, it kind of fixed the thing in 60 days, gave them enough time. Many times, people just shorten the activities at the end of the job, so you end up with you know, activities that are all staged, and then something happens there, and you're gone. So the idea of kind of dealing with those decisions early on, coming up with some plan, whether it's 60, 30, whatever the date may be, is really important in terms of following a good protocol. And then the schedule, that schedule then becomes the plan going forward. And you use that as the updated schedule. You can acknowledge it. You still may have to worry about who pays for it, but you can acknowledge that's where the job is. Um, we kept on that job where we had three or four impacts at 
a day, we kept a live log of those impacts. They got incorporated, when did they occur, what part did they occur on. At the end, we could kind of say, okay, this worked out, something came up, the end of the month, we have a net, you know, 10 days negative or 10 days positive. We could then make decisions. Sometimes they could work it around during the field and we'd recover, but at least we had a list of it all and we could go back and make decisions on it and that became the way to resolve it. This is an example of a real case and it's a railroad underpass. It's really simple. I just want to lock in what the fragment looks like. You know, this was a job where after a railroad was moved, the trains to a shoe fly, which is nothing more than a, a bypass track, um, the demolition of the existing underpass was scheduled to start. So the following graphic shows the work as planned. Note that the project in this graphic was 22 days behind at this point due to an extended duration of the railroad work to shift the trains to the shoe fly, which was a separate issue. So here's a P6 schedule. We got the demo of the bridge here. You'll see it's red, it's on the critical path. You can see the negative 22. So that's what we had going into this demolition. What happened? As soon as the demolition contractor started work inspecting the existing bridge to be demolished, asbestos was discovered in the waterproofing membrane on the existing bridge. So a separate asbestos removal contractor was mobilized, came to the job, did its work. However, the delay impacted the critical path after inserting the asbestos removal duration into the schedule as shown in the following graphic. So what Joe did on this job was he then put this fragment in, he identified it promptly, gave it a number 1A, 1101, there's the asbestos, it was 24 days to do that work, put it into the baseline schedule, re-ran the schedule, that's the only thing he added, put the logic in, it was a finish to start, finished uh, the asbestos, start the demo of the bridge, simple logic, re-ran the schedule, and what we ended up with is we ended up with a minus 42 here in terms of the uh, total float. But if you look up here, the overall project is project milestone only went a minus 19 because we had some free float in there. So what that did was with the newly added activity, which reflected the duration and scope of the asbestos removal, the critical path was impacted 20 days on the successor work activities, the total float increased from a minus 22 to minus 42. However, due to the free float down path of the completion milestone, the project was only impacted in minus 19 days. And so therefore, the owner issued a change order for 19 days to the contractor, and it was executed. So that's a, just a, a simple illustration of how the fragment works. It gets sometimes a little more complicated, but that's basically it. And if you just keep it and identify it, one of the things you can point out, sometimes you don't know it's going to be 24 days. Sometimes you get a situation, I don't know, um, you know, I remember asking the question, well, what happened? We have groundwater. We're going to have to grout or whatever we're going to do. How long is it going to be? I don't know. Well, is it going to be a day? No. Is it going to be a month? I don't think so. Okay, we pick a date, put it in there, 20 days for argument's sake. And, you know, it's funny from a scheduling point of view, engineers like to be precise. So, you know, I don't know, I don't want to. Well, then you play a little game with them and you kind of come down, okay, just put something in there that's reasonable. We can come back and revisit it, okay? So you pull it out of them, you put it in, you run the schedule, and you see what happens. What that does, it's a reasonable guess, but now you can tell the owner, geez, it's going to move it, the milestone. Let's say in this case it's minus 19. I can't live with that. I got whatever the situation is, what are we going to do? Then you can make it, well, should we double up? Should we work weekends? Should we do a double shift? Should we get another contractor? So you start thinking, and that's the key part of it, is to start thinking. If it's half that time, great. If it's more, maybe you've mitigated some of it. So that's the whole purpose of this thing, and it's really interactive, and the, the fun part of this is, um, it's if you really like the interaction and you really got to like change because no, nothing goes as planned. If you don't like change, it's probably not your cup of tea. Um, but you got to deal with people. You got to deal with all those idiosyncrasies. And, you know, you come to work and you kind of lay out a project schedule. Everything looks good. And, you know, at the end of the day, it all just went to hell. I remember one case where we had all the subs in the meeting. It was going down. And I was going on vacation for a week. And we weren't really the contract. We were just coming in as this third party. I had the plumber, the electrician, the tin knocker, 
and the guy's sitting there, the drywall guy, and we're gonna go, we're gonna go left to right, left to right. Everybody got that? Left to right, clockwise. We're gonna start here and go left to right. Okay. So I go away, come back on vacation. I look at the schedule and I go, what the hell happened? Where was the plumber? He, he went right to left. So I, you know, it was like, took them all out in the field and they were, it was sort of like kids. You took them out in the field. Okay guys, where's right to left? And I got two of them go this way, they go, no, no, no. So they got it back. But I mean, you know, it's like plain English. It goes back to the subcontractor. The plumber had to put pipe in the air. He saw an opening, he was putting pipe in, but it wasn't where he should have put it in. So, you know, you can take the obvious and you can explain it, but you better follow up and just make sure it didn't, you know, they get it. A um, couple of, um, these are just two case examples. I've sort of highlighted a little of them. One was a government laboratory, it was about 200 million, and the other was a um, 600 million LNG. So they're pretty big projects, um, and the schedules are fairly li large and sizable. Both had good specifications. Both ran fairly well. They, they did have some disputes. This one had some disputes. It got resolved because we had good contemporaneous information. This design build was probably one of the best specs I've ever seen. It was in Texas, and um, they had a really good team. Um, we had an interesting oversight role on it, but they really managed it. They, they got the idea. They brought back the schedule recovery. Um, they actually had some interesting elements with float. They let the contractor own certain float, and there were certain rules about what the contractor could do with his float and when it had to be recovered if it threatened the milestone. And, and if it didn't threaten the milestone, then they could work through it. If it threatened the milestone, the owner had, the contractor had 60 days to recover, I mean, typically over time or more, st more crews. Um, so just to summarize a little bit, maintaining an accurate as-built schedule, with realistic completion logic, allows for sound basis and decision making. All three parties, major parties, should agree early that the resources will be provided so you can maintain the schedule. And also acknowledge that the change and impacts will occur. They will occur. How do you manage them? And how do you keep from having a dispute process? You may still have commercial, but at least you can get the time resolved. Um, the best means to do this is with contemporaneous time impact analysis. You may have issues that come up. You may not have to put every little thing in. It can be recovered, but you should put the material elements into it so it accurately, accurately reflects the plan. Um, it also gives you a much better understanding of the to-go schedule in terms of how to work subsequent activities. It can be evaluated to part, any of the parties anytime they want and what actions necessary to recover or downstream or if they're gonna make a design change, they can incorporate that. And again, if an argument ensues, um, at least it's just cost, it's not time. You've got that sorted out. Um, pretty good, I guess. Um, questions, happy to answer any. The type of lawn we use, which is um, usually fescue, ryegrass, and Kentucky bluegrass, not only is this grass not native to Michigan, it's not even native to this continent.